everybody. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel, Instagram Live. Also, our seminar here in Colmar, Pennsylvania. Woo! Woo. All right, no one clapped. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A. Um, we're going to do it a little differently this time. So what we had is 35 people submitted their questions to Leah Lutz. Leah Lutz is the final arbiter of all these questions. She decided what was relevant, what was irrelevant, and funny questions. I understand she merged some questions as well that were similar. So they've been curated thoroughly for us. Curated questions. I thought this was going to be like a moderate, like a debate thing, and you and I were just going to debate. I always thought that would be a really awesome way mm -hmm. to do this, but you don't agree. You want to debate about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. My time. Nice. I see the rest of my time. Nice segue. Okay. Uh, so this first part is about coaching. Uh, the question is, advice on making one's mark in the fitness industry as a new gym owner? Hmm. You, you want me to? You can start while I think. Okay, great. I'll just uh, put that. That's up. the typical way this goes. Yeah, I see. I need to think more. Uh, so I think, I, well, I guess I think that the premise of the question is maybe misguided because making your mark in the fitness industry is not the same as making a living as a gym owner. And I think that the business of business is business. And your first goal should be to be successful as a gym owner, meaning that you get to stay open for a long period of time, help as many people as possible. And being a successful business owner in the fitness industry is a very powerful position to have because you are unique if you get to do that. Most gym owners do not make a lot of money, and that's due to running their business in various uh, ways of disrepair. Um, I was actually just at a very popular gym, popular on social media. Uh, popular in this area and the gym owner there hates it he says he loses money every month uh you know that the people aren't grateful and he, he doesn't enjoy doing it and he'd happily sell the gym if he could although he's losing so much money on it that he doesn't think that he could do it. no one would want to buy no one it. would buy it the, so the my thing is i think the best thing you can do as a new gym owner is to uh is as follows one make sure that your business practices are in line with keeping you in business for a long period of time. Two, make sure that your customer service, that's your number one priority. And this is a customer service industry. So make your word of mouth advertising and word of mouth sort of reputation is going to do way better than any Yelp review or any paid advertising on Facebook or whatever like that. So you have to take care of your customers. And the third thing that you can do is to really try to cultivate a culture within your gym with about resistance training. If you can have a gym that really prioritizes getting stronger, using barbells to do that, and uh, is supportive, like everybody is you know, supportive of each other's goal, that's a very unique training situation. I mean, we've been fortunate to train in a lot of really cool gyms across the area. Some of them have great equipment, you know, and the people there are kind of, eh. Other places have terrible equipment, people are cool, and everything in between. We would like to go to a place with awesome equipment, awesome people, and uh, and everybody's supportive, you know. So I guess if I could sum this up neatly, I think that you have to make sure that your business is solvent first and then curate the culture by uh, having an educated client base. And I think that would be better than having a bunch of self-important power lifters or crossfitters or weightlifters running around, ruining all your equipment, leaving a mess and not paying their monthly bill because ah, I forgot. All right. And you don't need the athletes to legitimize your gym. You need people who are interested in showing up on a regular basis, paying their wage and who want to work hard and want to learn. That's who you want as your gym member. So I think doing that could help build the business and make you more useful in the fitness industry. Yeah. I think I'll take the other side of the question. So Jordan has experience, uh, I don't know if it was owning or just operating within the context of the gym, of the gym business, um, which is let's see, <laughs> which is not necessarily something that's within my lane. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I've not owned or operated a gym before myself. Um, but as far as making a mark in the fitness industry, which is arguably something that we are trying to do, or hopefully have started to started to do it's at this point. Mark, yeah, yeah. It's well, it's a somewhat unique mark compared to many other kind of coaching or resistance training based uh, organizations. Weird flex, but okay. <laughs> but so, I mean, I think that the the first thing that we did was try to learn as much as possible ourselves. And so, if you think you're going to make your mark without knowing anything, uh, good luck. 
uh, I think that there is something to be said for the value of experience insofar as we both have been training for a very long time, have achieved some uh, mediocre to decent level of uh, success, you know, competing and performing within the sport and coaching other people to reasonably good levels of, of performance within the, within the sport. But I think that our goals have been fairly explicitly laid out this weekend, right? So we've talked about, uh, you know, the role of strength and conditioning training and nutritional interventions in the pursuit of uh, improving health, reducing the uh, prevalence of disease, reducing the risk of mortality. And then basically we followed the evidence to guide our recommendations on the matter. And I think that's something that is uh, somewhat unique in the industry um, from, from our perspective. And we have the benefit, of course, of having professional training in the matter, right? We have medical school, which is not just something a degree that, mill, <laughs> right? which, which helps us with, with a lot of things and give, certainly gives us a certain platform level of authority to speak from. Um, but I think that a lot of the concepts, for example, that I laid out in the pain lecture, a lot of the concepts that have been laid out in the nutrition lectures and the programming lectures are things that you can take with you. And our bias is that that's what we would like people to promote because we think that those are the best way to, to manage things and follow the evidence and be open minded and change your mind when you find things that are wrong. And uh, just generally, that'll probably lead you to achieve good results with folks and, and help people out and make them uh, not prey on people, not prey on making them dependent upon you as a, as a coach or a practitioner or a therapist or whatever the case is. And word of mouth will do the rest. You know, we yeah. don't go out of our way to advertise all of our stuff. You know, we just try to do a good job with things. And well, I don't know, word of mouth has done quite a lot, I think, from... from uh, well, I, I've sold our souls, but I did. How so? Well, I got a, some marketing folks, mm -hmm. you know, and they like are on the Facebook algorithms and the grams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, got to look, you know, it's funny. I did. I was dating a girl. Well, that's a strong word. I was talking to a girl and she said, hey, do you have a newsletter? I said, why well, we have a newsletter? That's just inbox marketing. I don't want to do that. And she goes, you should start a news an email list to just to keep in contact with your audience. base." Oh, I know who this is. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> well, and I was like, fine. Right. And now <laughs> and now our 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 email list is close to 100,000, which our emails that go out aren't marketing. Right. We're not trying to sell people on stuff. We're telling them, hey, this stuff is you know, available if you were like looking for it. But also here's all this content. And so and I started doing that in 2006 when I was coaching people mm -hmm. for the you know, I put out these newsletters like, hey, here's a recipe. Hey, here's a study I just read. Hey, here's something that you might want to know, because the idea was always quality. Right. Like to the best of my ability, I want to be the best coach, best trainer, sure. best doctor, whatever you know, it's possible. And I think focusing on that, like you said, is probably the key. I think a lot of people don't want to go through the steps of becoming a subject matter expert. And then it becomes harder to differentiate yourself from other people. Right. Right. You're just a guy. Because if, because if, yeah, exactly. Because everybody else is doing the same thing in the fitness industry. And unless you're an expert, it's hard to differentiate yourself. So I would put my efforts towards being an expert. Read more. Type yeah. less. It sounds like a song from Hamilton. <laughs> Read more. Type less. No. No one saw Hamilton. Never okay. Seen it. Well, I'm more cultured than you are. Fact. Facts. Okay. Second question. With the knowledge that we have, what are some of the guidelines uh, to determining what is appropriate to do as a coach and when to refer to a higher power? I assume by higher power, we don't mean God. <laughs> <laughs> well, dear God. <laughs> Please help this client. Please help this client. <laughs> he makes no gains. Yeah. Well, I think the evidence suggests that, you know, when you pray for a person versus not praying, they do worse with the prayer. Uh, yeah, well, not <laughs> moving on. Um, I think having an uh, awareness of, of your scope of practice is the main key here. You know, it's you since you're not prescribing medication, you should automatically know that telling somebody to stop or start medication is not within your wheelhouse. Right. Uh, every certification that I'm aware of has certain contraindications to training that you should be familiar with. And to the extent that you disagree with them, that's fine. But you have to know why you disagree with them. So I think what happens is people earn a certification and then they sort of, they stop learning. I mean, if you, if you sure. yeah. looked at a thousand trainers and you looked at how many people actually read a bunch to sort of improve their skill set after they became a trainer, you know, year two, four, six, you're just going to see this huge fall off. So I think the best thing you can do to hedge your bets of knowing like what is the scope of your practice is to, is to read and be intimately, intimately familiar with what are the most common medical problems that your clients have 
right? If it's high blood pressure, diabetes, low back pain, you know, these are the heavy hitters in primary care, likely to be the heavy hitters in your personal coaching practice. So you need to know well, where can I stop? Where does my recommendation, where do my recommendations stop? Where, where can I no longer feel comfortable talking about this? And I think to the degree that you can know that without any further reading, this seminar helps distinguish some of that, but you have to inform yourself about the conditions that your clients have. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm going to kind of, kind of compare it to the way the medical world operates a little bit. So it's important to know your legal scope of practice, which I think is the main thing that Jordan was referring to, right? So there are laws about, you know, practicing as a, as a dietitian, if you're not actually a dietitian in various states, for example, and how that impacts your ability to deliver nutrition advice to a client. So it's important to be aware of that, for example. Um, your ability to comment on medications as a coach, probably limited, of course. So it's important to know the legal limits. However, from a more practical standpoint, I think it parallels medical practice quite a bit. Because, for example, I know what my general scope of practice is, right? However, if there's ever something that I just simply feel uncomfortable managing, then I can refer to somebody who I trust to take care of that condition. Even if it's technically within my scope of practice, if I haven't done it in a while or if I'm not entirely sure what to do with this patient, I can refer to a specialist and they'll say, hey, thanks for sending this patient over. I'll help out. And then I have two options. Either I can keep doing that in the future or I can look and see what they did and learn from it and then do it myself the next time I run into that situation and effectively sharpen my own scope of practice where I can handle something. So for example, I have a patient with say some form of chronic kidney disease. And I'm like, uh, I haven't, you know, I'm not, not specifically, I'm not particularly confident with this specific case. Let me get a nephrologist opinion on it. And he's like, oh yeah, just order this, this, this. And I'm like, make a mental note. Oh, this is what you do in this situation. So the next time I see it, I can handle it. So from a coaching standpoint, there's an analogous situation where you know your legal limits of practice, where you don't go way outside your, your legal scope of practice. But let's say that somebody has some sort of an ache or a pain or something like that, that you don't necessarily know how to manage. Maybe you refer them to Mike or Derek, our rehab guys, or you refer yeah. them to me or something like that. And I say, hey, I assess this patient or we assess this patient. We provide some recommendations. Here's how we would manage this specific situation. And here's our recommendations. You can say, all right, cool. So next time somebody hurts, I can keep, I, I trust these guys. I'm going to refer them to them. Or you can say, oh, that's interesting. Let me go read the uh, research or the evidence basis for their recommendations or why they managed it a certain way. And I can learn from that. And the next time I run into this situation, since it's within my legal scope of practice, I can do it. Yep. And then you can grow your skill set and you can, you know, it's not like I just magically learned how to like rehab folks. Same with Mike, you know, got some level of training, read tons. It like higher, It was a higher power. Right. Higher power. <laughs> we read insane amounts, of course. Um, and, and all of that helps. And so you can, you can grow the scope of practice that you're comfortable with or confident in managing within your legal scope by reading more, practicing more, trying things, experimenting, trial and error, stuff like that, and learning from your experts or your colleagues or your peers who you trust for, for advice on, on matters. Sound good? Yeah, I agree. I just, you know, there, there are no hard and fast rules here and, uh, trying to improve again, uh, uh trying to attain expert level status is like, you know, takes that's a long time. Well, yeah, but the attempt, making progress towards that is ultimately what's going to help all of these. Yeah. Things. Yeah. And it's I, an active search. I'll say that. I mean, right? no, I stopped. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, you don't accidentally become an expert in something. Lucked into it. Read the right book. That one weird trick. Yeah. All right. If you had a magic wand, what two to three things would every doctor, if you need a specific type, primary care doctors, uh, what would every doctor change about their daily practice? Alternatively, what three things would you have every doctor learn? Ooh. This is a tough question. Man, All right, I'm going to get so greedy here. Three, two to three things every doctor would do would change about their daily practice. Thing one, they would train themselves one hour a day, do something related. I would have every doctor do that. Two, uh, I, would ha I would have them track their nutrition. <laughs> I would have them do it. Because, because so, and here's the rationale why. Because if we agree that obesity and uh, deconditioning or being undertrained in general is such a wide pervasive problem, right? Those two things are huge uh, problems and we're in primary care docs are at the forefront of this, right? Then they need to have strategies that they can give patients. And if they have no personal experience with this, I don't care what the recommendations are and how widespread those recommendations are published. 
if there's no personal experience, this doesn't become a thing that they can rattle off at right. the end. So we need to, you know, the change needs to be be occurring there. And then the third thing I would have them do would be to actually counsel their patients on exercise. I mean, <laughs> sure. that would be my, those would be my three things. But the, the first two, the first two, you know, sort of gal, uh, you know, uh, forge the third one. Mm-hmm. You, you, the third one isn't isn't possible without the first two. You don't see people who train productively and do effective things with their nutrition, and then on the other end of it, they're like, "Well, that was a huge waste of time. Let me not go tell anybody." About yeah, exactly. This. Yeah, so, you're right. That's the first thing they start yeah. saying. Yeah. Okay, so I'll agree with those, and then my main addition. What do you think it's going to be? Next edition. New addition? The, the addition. The addition. To your criteria is going to be that they're going to learn basically oh, everything I yeah. everything I taught in the pain science thing. Yeah, sure. And the role of their words and their interaction with patients um, yeah. so that they just stop harming patients. I mean, I literally got a message um, right before we started pressing where a friend of, my mes- friend of mine messaged me and he said, so my, I think it was his mother-in-law, said that she was recently diagnosed with osteoporosis in her hip. Or something oh, like that. Oh, I it's saw that message. Of, yeah, true. And odd to be a, that uh, focal of a location. But I'm assuming it's osteoporosis in her whole body, and they diagnosed it based on a hip Z bone score. density. Yeah. And uh, she said she felt fine. She wasn't in any pain. And apparently, this doctor, who I think he said was a neurologist, so I don't even know why he was speaking about bones, because it's not neurology. Is neurology he said a bone that, doc? That's weird. You should be in pain with that. Like he expected her to be in pain. So he told her, yeah, you should be in pain since you have that. Well, I am now. Yeah. You're going to tell somebody that? Yeah, well, I am now. You just yes. get a couple of Norco, go home, you're fine. Yeah, so I wish that everybody would understand the effect of their words and the ripple effect on the... Re- like, arguably, that similar to what I presented earlier today, that could literally have an effect on the entire trajectory of this lady's life in terms of the activities she pursues, the things she does, engages in, chooses to avoid, is afraid of, or willing to do. So that is the main thing. Yeah. Go start with the JAMA article, the iatrogenic potential of the physician's words, and go down the citation rabbit hole from there. And so that would uh, be the, that would be the one thing you'd have them learn. Uh, well, if you had to pick three things for them to learn, that would be one of them. Yeah, the rest are things you already. So did. I would have them do the a, the uh, AACE obesity, obesity guidelines. guidelines. Yes, and then the ACSM exercise guidelines. Sure. I think there you go. That's, that's our up. that is our list, Doctor F- Doctor Friends. You're not our enemies, you're our friends. Yeah. We just want you to- Exercise these, guidelines, obesity guidelines, the pain science stuff. These three weird tricks to, Stop you know, saving things. the world. Yeah. Neat. Sounds good. Neato, gang. Uh, oh, how might these changes reflect in patient outcomes? Oh yeah, so they'd be in less pain, they'd be in better shape, <laughs> we'd prevent, you know, a large percentage of the diseases that are preventable, and we reduce our GDP on healthcare. Yes. So that would be neat. You know, because then you guys spend more on barbell medicine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just going to cut that out. Mark that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> time management. How to best utilize training time as a full-time working mom. There's an exclamation point. Uh, so this is just chicks. Oh, okay. Well, now. Okay, so how to best utilize training time as a full-time working mom. Any advice for shift workers? Any training and recovery strategies for frequent weekly travelers? All right, so let's do this thing, mom thing. I don't know what it's like to be a full-time working mom. I, you know, I just don't know. I do know what it's like to be a resident uh, in, you know, medical residency, also running a business, an international business that takes up a lot of time and then also still training for a powerlifting meet. And it was fine. Uh, my advice for that isn't really, is is more that you're going to make the time to train if you want to train. And I would encourage you to find that time. It is personal investment time. So effectively, you're investing in your physical 401k and only you can make the decision to make the deposit. And I think that to the degree it compromises your sleep, that's fine. Do it. Nate's cringing over here. Well, (laughs) look, I would prefer if you could still manage to get a full night of sleep, but I understand that these things are compromised sometimes. Sometimes life is imbalanced. Yes. And sure. I would rather have you exercise and train than not train. And I don't know if I found a satisfactory excuse for missing training. If we had, we wouldn't be where we are. Well, that's what I'm saying. And I, I don't think that you need to prep for a meet. And I don't think that you need to schedule your you know, toughest training sessions around the highest stress periods of your life. Okay. 
So that being said, I don't, I still find no excuse for missing training. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if you're not healthy, if you're not capable, if you're not, uh, uh, you know, investing in yourself so that you're around here for a long time, highly functioning, then ultimately you're compromising your ability to do good in this world for your family, for yourself sure. for a long period of time. That's selfish. So the way I view it is this is an investment you have to make into your longevity. And there are zero compromises that I'm willing to make for that for myself. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that's been cool um, over our years of interacting and, and sometimes training together is that we basically agree on we'll always make time for whatever is most important to us. Yeah. We've had some pretty insane schedules over the years. Um, and having watched, for example, my wife, who has an even more insane schedule as an OBGYN, making time to train twice a week uh, is, you know, it's fine. It works okay. It can be done. And there are various strategies you can use from a programming standpoint, right? So you don't need to run this template flawlessly and have 90 minute or 120 minute training sessions six times a week or something like that to make some amount of progress or just to stay in the gym sure. and, and training productively. Well, we have a time crunch template. We have time this. crunch and I use these kind of strategies. I have, for example, some some clients that I program for and on, on as a default, for example, they're on a four day a week template and when stuff gets real crazy for them, I have an alternative option where they can collapse things down into a three day a week template. And if they collapse it down to a three-day week template and their sessions are still running too long, then I say, hey, just take the third exercise of each session and turn it into a myo rep deal or an yeah. AMRAP deal. Or it takes five, 10 That'll minutes That'll take do. it down to a five-minute five minute last exercise. So work, yeah. work through the first two. So I give them multiple kind of a management algorithm for their training so that they don't have any reasons where they're like, oh, I couldn't train. Because if you can carve out, if they can carve out 30 minutes, 40 minutes, they can get in and out. All you need to do is show up and put your phone in airplane mode people don't realize how much time they waste sitting on their phone in between sets and stuff oh, like that. Now that Apple has that screen time thing. <laughs> oh yeah, it tells That's you. the most depressing thing ever. I had yeah. to turn it off. Yeah. I don't wanna know. It also, the number of notifications I get every day yeah, yeah. annoyed me. Same. You know? So, hey. so you know, like as an example, this past week, I had a fairly long work day in the hospital and I have a fairly uh, intense training session that I had to get through that evening. I had to do seven sets of six on the squat. You're welcome. Yeah. And then I think I had four or five sets of eight on the bench press you afterwards, and it was done in 58 minutes. You're welcome. <laughs> Squatted up to 5.30 for a set of six, did some back offs, benched my sets of eight, I actually supersetted my benches with my squats. I did no rest between my warm up sets, and I left time to rest a little bit longer between my heaviest work sets. It was done in under an hour. Sounds like Of course, that is a benefit of having a nice, finely developed work capacity, if I may say so uh, myself. But that's why we program things Weird the way flex, we can, okay. so that you don't have to freak out if you can't do your programming perfectly, right? In addition, auto-regulation is handy so that you don't say, I have to show up to the gym today, I have to lift this exact weight for this exact reps or I'm a failure or I'm wasting my time if I can't get my sets sure. or my reps in. You can auto-regulate, adjust things if you need to so you don't miss your sets or your reps. You get productive training in and when you have more time, right? You can take your time, you can PR, it's all good. You didn't waste that week in between where you said, oh, because I can't fit my whole training session in perfectly, I'm just gonna skip it. Right. Well, we've talked about this before. How many sessions we've missed in the past 10 years? It's like three or something yeah. like that. Two, something crazy. I had Vegas flu. Yeah, I was on my honeymoon. Other than that, oh, that's no same. sessions missed. Right? Yeah. What and that's think, how you make progress. What do you think the worst time for you was training? Uh, like, the, the worst time, time in my life training was, surgery was my third year of medical school. <laughs> I knew you were going to say Rotating in surgery. And retrospectively, looking back now, I have a whole, I have a slightly different perspective on the matter. Sure. Because it wasn't just the hour. So I had to show up to the, I had to wake up around 3.45 or 4 in the morning, something like that. Go around, it was yeah. winter in Norfolk. I had to go outside and scrape the ice off my car yeah. at around 4, 4.15 in the morning. Hop in my car, get to the hospital around 5 or something like that. So I could pre-round on the patients and round with the team and then get in the operating room by 7.30. And I remember the worst day, the nadir of my life, right? In a head and neck cancer case, they were excising some huge basal cell invasive tumor into this guy's temporal bone. Uh, surgery started at 7.30 in the morning. I was there until 9.30 at night in one surgery the entire time. Sure you and uh, lot, they yeah. finally were like, yeah, I guess you can go home now. And they were probably operating for another hour or two. And uh, I wanted to quit medical school. Yeah. I was like, hey, how can I not do this anymore? So during that month where my schedule was something like that, I was literally waking up Bro. before going in. 
and running to a local gym that was like a block away that was a pretty crappy gym I would do one big lift, I would squat or bench or deadlift or something like that, and then do a five minute AMRAP and leave and get to the hospital. This was before going in, I was doing that. Yeah, uh, It was terrible, yeah. And looking back, you can see there was a whole lot of uh, allostatic load going on in my life, a whole lot of external stressors and things like that that were affecting my training response, my stress response, my uh, motivation, my interest to train, all that kind of stuff. So basically since then it's all been good downhill. Everything's been easier ever since then. Even residency was easier than that. <laughs> I think ICU was the worst for me. Yeah, ICU is all right. I mean, not when you're running barbell medicine sure. and you live in LA and yeah. it's the 22 miles from your house <laughs> to the hospital and then you have to figure out which gym that is another 20 miles from the hospital is the closest to you in LA rush hour traffic. Yeah. And then if you have to be up at 3.30 in the morning the next morning, like how much you're not gonna sleep. Sure, yeah. There are only so many, there's not enough hours in the day. In they, yeah, you run out of hours. Yeah. I think I missed some programming in there at some point. So I'd be like, dude, I don't have programming. Like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I still trained. So yep. you make time for what's important to you is what we've kind of consistently said on the matter. That's issue. worse for my dating life though, you know? Like don't say that too loudly. Cause then people are like, you, you said it. You make time for what's important to you. <laughs> like, yeah, about that though. I meant with training, not like, you know, personal stuff. Well, that, all right. That's you, bro. Yeah. Uh, all right, any advice for shift workers? Uh, same advice. It is the same advice. Also, like, I just wouldn't expect you to do worse if you're a shift worker. Sure. I would expect you to do great, fine, until proven otherwise. My general, you know, people are like, hey, but I do this. Does this make me special? Am I gonna get worse results? My expectation is that you're actually gonna do just fine until proven otherwise. My expectation is that you're a stud until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Stud until proven otherwise. Uh, all right, any training recovery strategies for frequent weekly travelers? Uh, no, it's just fine. I frequently travel. The most difficult part about it for people, I know a lot of people in the it's business and finance, finance world is finding a place to train. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, I have this hotel gym. And I'm like, that's rarely adequate, but if that's all you have, then you're gonna have to find a way to yeah, make it work. Yeah, but let me just say that if you're going to a civiliz civilized you know, city, you type in that city name and you say, like Philadelphia Black Iron Gym, and the things <laughs> are gonna pop up. Usually. And if that doesn't pop, a 24 hour fitness, or what, like you can train. When people are like, oh, I can't train because I'm traveling, I'm like, I've never been traveling, literally sure. never been traveling and I've been unable to train. The worst- Tom the, knows. Tom knows, the worst thing has been when we were in Hamburg, Germany, all right? And they didn't have, you couldn't get enough plates on the bar. And so I was trying to do pause deadlifts of like 540 or something and the weights just fell off the bar. Cause that, you know, nobody was actually strong at that gym. They're like, Bob, ah, steels, nine, we don't need them. Just like, bumpers. Just bumpers, bumpers only, it's fine. No one's ever gonna lift over 500 pounds here. You ran into that problem in multiple gyms in Europe. Yeah, the running joke was, I was too strong for Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, European, I get that you're strong. Marty Syme disagrees. Yeah, Marty Syme disagrees, yeah. But, so if you're an Olympic training hall or a powerlifting gym, sure. that's different. But yeah, I, I, I don't empathize or, or sympathize with people who are, say they can't find a place to train. Like, look, if you're drilling for oil off the coast of Alaska and there's literally no, like, okay, you win, all right? <laughs> but if you're traveling within the continental United States and you're like, I can't find a gym, I'm like, I, that's- Look th harder. Yeah, look harder. Like, use the Google machine. Google is a search engine that you can pull up on literally any device connected to the internet and you can find a gym. Like, oh, we don't have time. You have time to eat, time to sleep, got time to train. Moving on. Movements and programming. I'm curious if in your coaching practice you have ever seen clients get overstimulated or heightened sympathetic nervous system that might relate to anxiety and panic attack symptoms, or is it likely due to other factors not related to training? I've never actually seen somebody where it happens in, per in person where I'm like, okay, we're gonna do rack pulls, and they're like, oh no, rack pulls, oh no, not again, not again, and then they go into a corner and have to do the breathing thing. Like that's never, ha I've never seen it in person, but I've had people email me where they say, hey, this particular movement I have, I'm like kind of freaked out about because the last time I did it, I hurt my back and I have like this, you know, negative psychological expectation that when I do this movement again, I'm gonna get hurt. I've had that email come in numerous times and I don't care enough about the variation to fight that battle. Other than to say, I don't think there's anything uniquely dangerous about this exercise, but I don't feel like fighting this. So they know, which is different than saying, that's cool, let's change the exercise. The idea is that I want to inform them like, hey, 
I don't. You're okay to do this. You're okay to do this, but hey, we don't need to you know fight every battle all the time. The only time I put my foot down is if it's like deadlift from the floor or a squat. You know, when they're like, I can't squat below parallel, and they start freaking out. And I'm like, I don't want you to miss this entire, you know, realm of exercises because you will not squat below parallel because you're afraid that your knee's gonna hurt and that freaks you out. In which case, it's just dr- gradual exposure therapy. You know, and that's what we do. We got a knee rehab template coming out that really kind of delves into this. We got Mike, uh, Dr. Ray, who's helped us out on that. And those, that's I put my foot down when it's like a whole movement Category that category. you think you can't do. It's the same thing nutritionally. Someone's like, I can't eat gluten. I'm like, oh, you have celiac? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, you know, I well, put my foot down well, there. Remember what I talked about during the pain lecture about the literature on uh, pediatric pain and patient uh, parents' responses to it. And one example is when they, the more they give the kid permission to avoid activity or to stay home from school or to not go to sports practice or something because of their painful condition, that actually is correlated with uh, disability later in life. And there's something to that in terms of the conditioning effect that it has, what you learn when you think that it's okay to avoid things that you are you know, afraid of or something like that. You just become, your, your, your scope of uh, kind of movement practice, you can think of it like that, becomes more and more limited as you limit yourself to, oh, I'm only safe to do this, that stuff I'm okay to avoid because it's bad for me. So you kind of just yeah. learn to become disabled. So I definitely wouldn't recommend going down, uh, going down that path. My perspective on this question is a little different, not necessarily because of anxiety or panic attacks being precipitated by a specific exercise prescription, but I've had clients who've messaged me about having anxiety attacks in the gym in general, panic attacks in the gym in general. And my next question to them is, tell me what's going on in your life. That's sure. usually something that can manifest itself. Tell me what's going on in your life. Tell me what your history is with these things. Tell me about if there are known triggers that you have, if something like that was going on. Basically, go into psychiatrist mode. Um, and are you and not a psychiatrist? Try to, well, receive not an insignificant amount of psychiatry training. Did quite a bit of it, actually, in, same, same. in, in residency. So, same, same. so uh, I don't claim to be a psychiatrist, but you know. So within my scope of practice to deal with some of these issues. So it's kind of uh, handy to have in this situation. So I actually just recently had a client this past week. He was like, man, I was going up to set up for my deadlifts and I got this anxious feeling, this kind of feeling in the pit of my stomach that tends to happen when my life stress is really, really high. Uh, and so we started to have a conversation about it. I initiated this conversation. Of, Tell me what's going on in your life. What's going on? Maybe I need to change what we're doing in, in training. Maybe I'm asking more of you than is appropriate given your overall allostatic load right now, right? Maybe I need to regulate things rather than saying, no, you need to do this or you're a pussy, yeah. right? Wow. <laughs> Jinx, so, I got you, so, man. So that's the approach that I would take for that is that uh, very often it's either been precipitated by a prior negative experience in the gym or there's something going on outside in the rest of their life that needs to be addressed. And uh, it's not necessarily just uh, being precipitated by the exercise itself. You just have to dig a little bit to find those things. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything else. Sounds good. All right. How does one differentiate between tendinopathy and tendinitis? Uh, you don't. Uh, you Mike, don't. agree. You don't. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, in the case of minor but nagging connective tissue injury, or does this not matter as far as the best approach to recovery? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter because you can't differentiate between the two. So I would just, I would just suggest not using the term tendinitis. Yeah, well, would, be, would you say tendinopathy? Uh, tendinopathy is an enormous umbrella term. Sure, well, that's what I'm point, saying. Which is, it's intentionally vague because it doesn't well, matter. Hey, man, I'm trying to get paid for this is. visit, so sure. I need an ICD-10 code. Right. So I think tendinopathy is sufficient for that. I agree. So the deal is, is that tendinitis is this uh, term that's historically been used, and itis, the ending, refers to acute inflammation, usually. Uh, and the evidence that tendinitis or tendinopathy has a whole bunch of inflammation going on in it is scant. There may be a few inflammatory cells that make their way into that tendon tissue, but it's not very much, and it's not a super inflammatory condition, and not surprisingly, uh, it does not respond to NSAIDs. So if your management or your coach's management of your elbow tendinitis or your patellar tendinitis or whatever tendonitis is to take a bunch of NSAIDs for five days and not change anything else, that is poor management, would not recommend <laughs> zero out of 10. Yeah, zero out of 10 would not do it again. Yes, so NSAIDs don't work for tendinopathy. 
Um, rather, tendinopathy is, we consider it, and we view it to be a load management oh, issue. This is what the research evidence tends to suggest. Um, I don't think it's useful to try to differentiate between tendonitis or tendinopathy, because I don't think tendonitis is a particularly meaningful term. The only thing that I may uh, delve into a little bit more is the uh, acuity or the duration of symptoms. In other words, if you've been feeling awesome, and then all of a sudden you do something and you're like, man, my patellar tendon is lit up today. And it's Not really like lit like good, but like lit yeah, bad. It's lit, yeah. In a bad and it way. doesn't feel good. Yeah. Then I'm gonna search for what changed in those prior 48 to 72 hours or whatever that may be useful to explain it. Maybe all of a sudden I introduced a new exercise that you went way heavier than I would have expected on. Or maybe you all of a sudden took up a new sport. You started playing basketball. Uh, and you're not used to playing basketball or maybe something else changed in your life and I can explain it that way and then I'm going to adjust your training load accordingly and I would expect if it's only been present for that short period of time a quick adjustment like that will likely be sufficient to uh, tamp it down and it'll feel better relatively quickly once we get you desensitized again whereas if you're somebody like Tom who says I've had patellar tendinopathy or quad tendinopathy for three years uh, and every time I squat, it's bothered me for years and years and years, or it's been chronic, relapsing, remitting, coming back and, 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 uh, and, and going away intermittently for years. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to things insofar as what my expectations are for your rehab, right? If it's only been present for a day, then I think I can probably knock it out just as quick if I adjust the training load quickly enough. If it's been present for years, then yeah, it's probably going to take a little longer for us to get this thing desensitized and calm down. That's the more useful thing I think it, uh, there is to differentiate from a tendinopathy standpoint rather than just choosing to label it tendinitis or tendinopathy or putting it in some specific box that isn't really all that meaningful. Well, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter if what you label it because the management is the same. Sure. Yeah. So. It's just the expectations for how quickly you might recover, I think, would be different between a very yeah, maybe an onset versus something that's been present for a long time. But only only because if it's been going on for so long, you can't possibly have the expectation that it's going to sure. get change overnight. But not because of Might the be diagnosis. Sure. But not yeah. because of the diagnosis. Right. Say, oh, this is tendonitis. So I just I don't call anything tendonitis. Yeah. I don't think you should call anything tendonitis. I don't yes. think you should take NSAIDs for tendonitis. Hundred percent. Quote unquote. If that wasn't clear. Squat therapy is what you need. Yeah. Tendonitis and eating more food don't fix tendonitis. They actually don't fix anything except for like you know. Being you know, underweight. Being underweight, potentially. <laughs> and then, you know, if you had a lack of like ulcers sure. or like chronic kidney disease and you yeah. really wanted to develop know, that. Develop that. <laughs> Ooh, okay. shots fired. Next. All right. Uh, what are some strategies for people who are in ED? Oh, eating disorder recovery. Hey, oh, every time I see. Yeah. Okay. Eating disorder recovery and have body composition goals uh, for whom tracking and counting mm. calories is a trigger for negative thoughts behavior. Yeah, refer that, to a specialist. Yeah, well, okay, hold on a sec. So I agree with you that referring to a specialist is probably, you know, the CYA sort of thing. And, and I agree because there are, so there's probably people who have done this a bunch of times and maybe have strategies that we can't think of. The, the problem is this. problem is this. There are not a lot of solutions that are available as, that will reliably allow someone to tra change their nutritional intake on a, you know, small, uh, very small, granular level, granular level sure. that don't involve some type of tracking. So what I have had people do who have been in ED recovery is have their meals delivered to them, but I I am contacting the meal service. So basically, I say, here's what I want this person to be eating, you know, approximate calorie wise, or whatever, and the meal service just drops the stuff off, and I'm like, hey, you eat this plus this plus this, do it. You know, but if I say, no, you're going to eat this many cups or this many servings. And it's on you to. 100%. So, so you're trying to remove that locus of control, like this internal locus. This is a one time you're trying to make it an external locus. So I've done the meal service deal uh, and I, I've done other sort of untrackable things where it's like, hey, you're going to have or, or less trackable. Like you have a palm size or hand size portion sure. and then two scoops of wet. Like the way you're trying to recommend somebody changing their macros has to do with things that are less easily trackable, right? So I'm like, hey, you need two fist size portions of fish or chicken or lean beef or whatever. And they're like, is that four ounces, six ounces, eight ounces? Like, nope, it's just fist size. And they're like, fist size. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't seen that before. 
weird flex, but okay. Like it's just. I think so this is. It, it, it sounds well. It sounds like you're describing a few general strategies, but I would hesitate to make those 100%. prescriptive to this population. It needs to be 100%. the most individualized prescription imaginable to these people I, based on their I history and their. One hundred percent agree. Yeah. The only reason I even offered them is to give people like, hey, these are things you can be thinking about sure. if you're trying to do that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that if the eating disorder recovery still needs additional care, that needs to be, you know, managed. Ongoing follow-up. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So, um, and then as the final thing I'll say, which is like the, you know, me raining on people's parades, you know, somebody who's in eating disorder recovery is like, look, I want to be an IFBB pro bodybuilder. It's like, okay, well, you're select, you're t- talking about two things that are kind of like, not complimentary here, okay? Just like the person who's got a 42 inch waist who is underweight who wants to be a world class level power lifter. And you're like, look man, you've been dealt a hand that is not compatible at this time <laughs> with that goal. And so I don't know if that's the best idea to have right now and perhaps we should you know, choose other, other goals that are, that are more uh, complimentary of where you're at right now, sure. supportive. That way there's not this huge like, you know, I have to, put out a lot of mental effort just to like st- stay in this, in this, in this line. It's a recipe for disaster, I think, in, in, in many Flirt, contexts. Would you say that they're flirting with disaster? Sure. Cue Molly Hatchet. I'm traveling down the road and I'm flirting with disaster. Okay. <laughs> Tom, mark that. <laughs> that joke fell flat. Let me delete that. Yeah. <laughs> it's crowds too young. They don't know who Molly Hatchet is. Uh, is a seven day fast safe to do any risks? Uh, if you're asking, could you fast from food for seven days and not die? The answer is sure. We're assuming they have no medical problems. I agree. Okay. But you know, the question is why? Really, the question is why. There are no benefits to fasting for seven days. Let's assume there, it's a religious thing. I agree. There are no <laughs> benefits to fasting for seven days. And I'm not trying to be a religious like, Ugh. but the, the point is this. Why? I don't have an answer for that. All right. Well, I'm just, would you be on my side for once? <laughs> <laughs> I would not necessarily recommend against it if somebody was like very religiously, you know, that's, that's their thing and they have to do it. That being said, if you have no medical conditions that, you know, like if you're not diabetic, right, that's a big one that I'm thinking of, yeah. Um, then yeah, you can fast for seven days and live a completely normal and full life afterwards, but just then reconsider why you're fasting for seven days. You, if you're saying don't drink water for seven days, would, uh, not, recommend. would not recommend and neither would your God. <laughs> well, Hopefully. I don't know of any gods that are saying don't drink water for seven days. <laughs> Would say. seem to be malevolent. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Next question. Got health, got holistic health doctors. They are pulling blood to find gut health and prescribe medications based on sufficiencies and insufficiencies found yep. within the body. Thoughts? Scam or useful? Was this drawn from Instagram Live? I don't know. I feel like <laughs> this is like a cartoon character. Yeah. So, all right. I think I recommended this question be included here so we can talk about gut health. So whenever we're going to talk about a purported problem, we have to be able to define what it is. This is the basis of, for example, a recent article that I wrote about scapular dyskinesis. We have to be able to define what is normal scapular movement, what is abnormal scapular movement. Sure. Right. In the same way we have for any health problem. What is normal blood or, sugar? Or reported or is, health problem. Yeah. We have to be able to. We have to be able to differentiate what normal. is normal and what is abnormal. And if it's abnormal, why are we defining it as such? Right. So in the health or the medical world, things that we define as abnormal are typically things that lead to consequences. Right. So the diagnostic criteria for diabetes, for example, is the blood sugar threshold above which we start to see risk for things like cardiovascular disease. Uh, complications and death increase. Chronic kidney disease. Right? Uh, if, yeah. if there was no risk increase until your blood sugar hit 400 on average, then our threshold for saying, oh, this is diabetes now, would be way higher because we'd have no justification for saying, oh, it's lower down here, even though there's no risk to that. Notice that in medic medical like tests, there's no like optimal range. 
Sure. Like it's yeah. Normal range. Yeah. <laughs> so Bad range. Well, I've had I've had patients send me their so so to yes, I'll get to that. All right. So we have to be able to define what gut health is. I have no idea of how we do that, and neither does anyone else. Sure. Neither does anyone else. Even if they claim to say, oh, gut health represents blah, 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 blah. It's just made up. There's no way to test it. There's no way to validate this. Yep. There's no complications of it outside of known medical disorders like inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, yep. potentially whatever evidence emerges in the near future or the distant future on non-celiac gluten sensitivity to whatever extent that ends up being a sure. thing of consequence, which I'm not ruling out the possibility of, right? But uh, gut health, just like when people say, what should I do for joint health? I'm like, what does that mean? Do your joints bend? Can you move? Sounds good to me. You know what I mean? So you have to have a definition. Shoulder health, man. What In the I absence of a definition, all these tests are difficult to interpret. Right? So remember in the testosterone lecture, I was talking about interpretation of these lab tests. If we check them and there's no symptoms, we don't know how to interpret these numbers. A low level in the absence of symptoms, what does that mean? Does it meet criteria to say, oh, there's an abnormality here. There's a disease here. There's a condition that needs treatment. No, we don't know because we can't say if we treat it, anything's going to get better because there's nothing to get better. You're fine. You have no symptoms. So I think that's the issue with this gut health kind of concept. It is very popular to discuss, particularly in alternative health fields. And what's worse about it, besides the fact that it's this very vague, nebulous thing and people are like, oh, well, you know, I get a little stomach discomfort when I have this food. I'm like, me too. I don't know what that means. Oh. Does it mean you ate too much? Does it mean that you read a magazine that told you you should feel bad when you eat gluten and now you feel bad when you eat gluten? because you expect that you should, because, you know, we weren't evolved to eat gluten after all. Well, you know, we were evolved to survive, this is, to be clear. Right, which means that, hey, if it contains calories, we can thrive on it if yes. we need to. We're highly adaptable organisms, including our guts, because that's how we see various populations around the world thrive on diets ranging from cow blood to whale blubber. Wait, do you not eat? And literally everything in between that you, humans thrive upon around the world. Do you not eat cow blood? That's my beverage of choice. Same. In fact. Yeah, I do, I do root beer plus cow blood. Right. Yeah. So Shot of bovine. It, it goes in line with this idea that there's like an optimal diet in the same way that there's an optimal, perfect way to move. You look around, there's all this variation. You look around the world, people thrive. People have survived and evolved and they're still around eating everything you can imagine from crickets to just, you know, completely plants to completely animals to just everything. So, and their guts seem to be fine and they don't complain about a little bit of mm, stomach doesn't feel great. Yeah, but you yeah. haven't run these gut tests. So the gut tests, that's the next topic of discussion is that most of these tests are either unreliable and any test that is unreliable, meaning not consistent, is automatically invalid, right? Because it can't, you can't trust it if it's not consistent. So the tests are either unreliable or invalid, or we don't know how to interpret them because they've not been consistently correlated with any sort of disease state or disease outcome or health outcome or something like that. So it's just overall very frustrating because I've had patients who've come to me with a whole bunch of labs that have been inappropriately ordered in a patient without symptoms often because they just want to check where they are with their gut. You don't want, you this don't happened want to me last week. They're like, I've heard about this food sensitivity thing. What do you think about this company? I just want to see where I'm at. I'm like, what do you mean? You want to see where you're at? You can eat food, right? You feel fine? Seems like you're fine, right? Instead typical, of ordering- Typical doctor. Yes, instead of ordering a bunch of tests, which because they're shitty tests or unva uh, invalid or unreliable, run the risk of what? Generating false positives or any abnormality that they're gonna look at and yeah. see, oh, my copper level is out of optimal range. What do I need to do about this, right? How can so I optimize my performance? Clearly, it's like, well, is the answer. you have a lot of other ways that you can optimize your performance and not worry about your optimal copper level because there is no optimal copper level. So this is the problem when I get these inside tracker lab reports. That, this look, lab that report, company's terrible. This company, Inside they print out lab reports with a stoplight 
signal next to the that's value. Right. That's right. So I've had people who say, oh, here's my full lab report. And every blood parameter you can order has a red light, meaning it's abnormal, which most labs will tell you if it's frankly abnormal outside the range. A yellow light if it's normal, but not in the optimal range, which has not been validated, or a green light if it's optimal. So I have patients who are like, oh, I saw on this complete blood count that I got that my mean platelet volume is not optimal. And I'm like, literally, I've seen thousands and thousands of patients. I have never once been concerned about any person's mean platelet volume in any scenario ever. Yeah, unless they I can like confidently beta thal or something. Not, I've never been worried about it because it's not a thing that we need to be worried about. I yeah. wish it wasn't even on there. Sure. But it's red, doctor. How do I optimize my mean uh, platelet volume? Why you just up the volume of your plates? So Is that not the yes. Thing? I hopefully conveyed sufficiently during the testosterone lecture how much of a not a fan I am of inappropriate testing. I think the tests we use should be selected carefully uh, in appropriate patients, and they should be selected and ordered and uh, tested in order to answer a specific question. That's the way testing is supposed to work, not shotgun tests to, quote, see where I'm at, because that doesn't mean anything and you can't interpret them because gut health doesn't mean anything unless you have an actual GI pathology. Sure. Yeah, I guess my the only thing to add to that, because I agree completely, is that if, if you're not seeing that the experts in that actual field ordering these tests rut routinely and interpreting them based on set criteria, then the test is bullshit. If the GI fellows, GI, you know, gastroenterology specialists were routinely ordering <coughs> gut health lab parameters, then you might have some indication to do that. If you had a certain set of uh, symptoms that would cause your gastroenterologist to order them. But if you're a chiropractor or naturopath or Reiki healer or, you know, trainer who is operating outside of the scope of their, you know, education, is saying, hey, you should order this gut health test through, you know, some lab who's freely willing to take, take your blood. money and your blood. <laughs> Basically vampires, to be honest. Weird flex, but okay. There, then you should you should wonder what the hell you're doing. I had to review so many of these inside tracker labs from these competitive CrossFit athletes, and they're like, oh, what does this mean? I'm like, nothing. What does this mean? Nothing. What does this mean? Nothing. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, if your doctor's not ordering the test, you don't have anybody to interpret this for you. You're just getting this useless readout, mm -hmm. all right, that's incorrectly labeled with no context, and you don't do anything with that. So I think if you're wondering, I just want to see where I'm at, right? Ask your doctor. I, same. I don't want to see where you're at unless you have symptoms. Okay? Because if, only if you have symptoms can I clinically correlate this. This is like me just getting a chest x-ray on everybody. It's like the radiologist at the end of every x-ray is going to say, please correlate clinically. It's like, oh, we don't have any clinical context. We just wanted to see where we're at. You know, shoot some, <laughs> shoot some radiation into us. See what happens. See where my lungs yeah. are at. Bro. Few millisieverts. I want to see where my costal ankle is. You know? <laughs> so, uh, I don't think that anybody should be using Inside Tracker for anything because if you have a real medical pathology, you're already being mismanaged by seeing Inside Tracker. So that's a problem. And, and then second to that. If you have actual symptoms, you need to see a real doctor who's gonna order real labs and then be able to interpret those clinically for you.